So I'll start with just uh, some brief sort of introduction from, from what I know about each of you, and, and we've had some conversations, and, and then maybe you can fill in the missing gaps. Uh, I met Rebecca a few months ago, Rebecca Mills. Uh, Rebecca is an inspiring uh, entrepreneur and, and thought leader um, who's doing some amazing work in, in thinking about the future of business organizations and, and how the, the structure of, of businesses can morph and, and become a force for good in the world. Um, someone who's really passionate about seeing a thriving and you know, beautiful world and someone who I think uh, really calls out the best in the people that she's surrounded with. Uh, I've known Simon a bit longer. Um, Simon has always impressed me with his knowledge of the New Zealand uh, ecosystem, um, both in terms of the business climate, but then also the interaction with government and uh, the different opportunities that exist for investment uh, in the country, and uh, also, you know, does a lot of work through his through his organization, Global Talent Network, Gro Global Career Link. Um, which is, you know, a big part of connecting New Zealand uh, and New Zealanders with global opportunities and, um, you know, connecting especially a lot of the young people with those experiences, which, which become so important in developing the, uh, the experiences, as, as Dave and Link mentioned. Um, I'm going to jump into some questions. If there's other information you guys would want to just... Anything else you want to... No, no, that pretty much sums it up. It was a very philosophical conversation <laughs> today, isn't it? It is, yeah. We, I, I was kind of originally maybe anticipating a, a little bit more um, tactical, but the, I feel like the first conversation that we had covered so much ground about the, the nuts and bolts of things. I, I'd love to maybe zoom out uh, a couple hundred feet and, and maybe take a look at a slightly bigger picture. Um, I'd love to start with a, a question for you, Rebecca. I mean, uh, you and I have spoken a bit about you know your experiences, and you've you've traveled all over the world, and you've met with with you know tons of business leaders through your work on the B Team, which is this really exciting project that's being uh, fostered um, by Richard Branson, as well as many other influential global leaders. Um, having gone through that experience, having traveled, seen all the world, met all these interesting people, um, you're still really really passionate about New Zealand and the opportunities that exist here. What is it about this place and what is it about the, this country that, that speaks to you as being different and unique uh, in creating unique opportunities for change here? Okay, so um, I'll just zoom out a, a little bit before... Um, oh, it's okay. <laughs> zoom out before answering that question just to give a, a bit of context as to um, why I believe that New Zealand could be a great petri dish for the world um, and a living demonstration of what it means to build businesses that are for people planet profit rather than profit alone. So I started life as an environmental scientist and liked all the geekery of biochemistry and chemistry. I, I graduated with my master's in science and quickly got interested in the future of energy in this country, um, in particular geothermal energy. This is back in the late 90s where I started... Um, looking at um, the infrastructure that we had here and um, working at a regional council level for energy infrastructure. After spending a number of years overseas, seven years um, retraining and design, um, I started doing master planning work and working with property developers um, in London and South East. Um, I was involved with sustainability and energy strategies for a number of different areas. And I guess it was through that time um, after doing a lot of work with government that I realised the power of entrepreneurship and the power of business um, to create truly transformative change at, at speed and scale and pace. Um, that led me to work, uh, to, to I guess focus a lot of my time and energy and, and passions into working with the most aspiring entrepreneurs on the planet and I wanted to start that at my home. I'd spent, you know, a number of years now living in... in primarily in Europe. I came back to New Zealand in 2009 and 10 and started shoulder tapping people who were doing interesting things to see if we could start some shit up here, basically. Um, so I'm getting to answer the question. One of those people was Derek Hanley, um, who some of you might know. He bought a ticket um, on Sir Richard Branson's spaceship and we started a conversation about 
the role of business and the role of business in creating a equitable, beautiful, um, sustainable planet for all of us to enjoy. So um, that those con conversations, I guess, transpired into what is now being called the B Team, which is a plan B for business, um, so that business is incentivized to be a force for good. So the last couple of years of my life, I've been um, forming a, a technical advisory group to create the agenda of what is plan B, what is the system that business is currently sitting within, what are those pressure points that we need to to, to locate so that, that one small change in one thing can create big changes in everything. So being a Kiwi um, and working very closely with Derek who became the CEO of the B team, um, Richard um, and, and Jochen were are very passionate about creating real life working models for what we're talking about at quite a conceptual system level change. So we've created this agenda of 10 things that we want to be looking at globally. Um, and in the last few months, I've come back to New Zealand after spending a period of time going between New Zealand and New York. And New York. We've finalised our global strategy of what can be this, this plan B for business and I'm now looking at the opportunities in New Zealand to create New Zealand to be a test bed and a petri dish for the world. Um, and so what that looks like as far as, you know, I've spent a period of time looking at the, the greatest environmental challenges that we have here and the greatest social challenges that we have there and then through the lens of business, how we, how we might we solve those. And ideally it's choosing ones that can be scaled globally and, and be used as a template for the world. So I think um, a lot of the discussion that we've already had this morning um, with Dave, who's nice to see your face. We've Skyped and thanks before, but never actually met. Um, yeah, and 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 Link, um, thinking about you know, there's a, there's a number of reasons that we've already kind of touched on as far as um, scalability and and the diversity that we have in this country. What is exciting me is um, that there are other business leaders and entrepreneurs, um, thought leaders. Um, who have formed part of the B Team Technical Advisory who are wanting to be a brains trust for this country and so that we can help scale some of these solutions. Um, I think with you know the digital revolution, this hot wire to the world concept where New Zealand can be the brains, um, a lot of the strategy, the R&D um, can happen here and then that can be taken to the rest of the world is, is really exciting and where I'm now wanting to focus. Um, my time. See, in our conversations, I know one of the the topics that you're really passionate about is is energy and, and ecological sustainability. And I know that that's also a passion that you have, Simon. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about some of the uh, organizations, startups, uh, initiatives that you've seen in looking at businesses who are sort of trying to implement these things, trying to, to implement solutions that uh, fulfill not just a, a commercial purpose, but really you know, people, planet, and profits, not just profits. Um, what are what are maybe a couple of the startups that, that you've seen specifically in the um, sort of ecological space that, that you were really excited about? I think, uh, Typically, if, if we're looking at the ecological space, there's a couple that, that we've invested in which uh, you know, are looking at processes that exist now, like um, coke and carbon, and can actually take waste matter and turn that into, into coke. So what is essentially, um, rather than having to dig it out of the ground, um, you know, taking, taking what exists in the world, but obviously that's sort of... A, a first step on a on a journey. I don't I don't see that that the world's just suddenly going to change in one day. But there's a there's a sort of a, a roadmap of of things that would happen whilst we look for more sustainable processes and, and systems in the world. But in the meantime, we go through incremental processes of not of not just um, you know, destroying what what nature's providing us but looking for alternatives to that until we get to alternative energy sources eventually. So there's, there's the 
cocification of carbon and there's also um you know, there's been some some interesting startups in and around um water that we've been looking at um obviously water is a fairly precious resource in the world at the moment um particularly if you look over to to countries which don't have a lot of water desalination doesn't necessarily provide them with uh, with all their water requirements yet if they want to grow crops locally which I know is quite a big passion of, of yours um, agriculture is obviously fairly water intensive how do they how do they look to recycle reuse that water what are some of the some of the companies that are being developed here in New Zealand have some reasonably exciting ways of extracting water f which is wastewater byproducts through semi-permeable membranes um, the irrigation companies there's a, a lot of work gets done on, on the irrigation in New Zealand, we are, we can be we are typically the leaders in that field. However, you know the rest of the world is slowly uh, is playing catch up. Um, the issue is sometimes until these things become a, a big social issue for people, there isn't necessarily the the impetus mm. that, that sits behind it. So I think that. Um, a, a lot of p putting putting people and social issues first is actually being able to have those social issues clearly articulated by people so that it actually drives the behaviour back um, and, and rewarding those businesses that are responsible f for doing it. And until, until the world starts following that particular behaviour, it, 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 sometimes it is a little bit difficult. Um, but there is a lot of exciting stuff being done here in, in New Zealand, the the issue gets back to how do you take it out to to the world again and make it and make it important. How do we how do we lobby governments to to get recognition that these are important issues that are being dealt with so that some of it can come in from from behind with governments. How do we get people thinking about sustainability as as the issues in the future as well? Great. Yeah, I mean this this idea that you know, Rebecca, you were touching on of, of creating sort of a, a, a test bed, a canvas where these solutions can be implemented first. You know, one, one idea that we talk a lot about is that, you know, we face all these different issues around energy and food security and, and inequality, um, but these aren't, you know, problems without solutions. You know, and many times we already know the solutions, but you can't solve them piecemeal. You know, you can't address uh, agriculture without addressing fossil fuels because those two things are so interlinked in our modern world. And so we say, you know, it's often more about integration than innovation. You know, it's about how do we bring these pieces together. You know, not a particular question, but more just a prompt. I'm curious, um, you know, are there things that we can do as a community to promote greater cooperation amongst people who are working on this so as to to focus on that integration and, and create these working models um, that not just you know work a little bit better but but maybe do radical improvements in the performance of organizations and processes um, with triple bottom line sort of accounting um, do you have any thoughts on that yeah and I, and I think that's a, a really great question and also um, one of the kind of the biggest, the, the driving engines of, of why I think New Zealand can have competitive advantage um, by the very nature of, of that we're a small country and that you can walk, you know, the 15 minutes across Wellington and bump into 20 people. So um, as far as um, creating the practical infrastructure to enable that collaboration, that's um, something that I've been spending some time thinking about who those people are, who those organisations are, in order to make that ecosystem, you know, run how it needs to. So I guess practically speaking, um, what we've done is we've created a, a ecosystem map of um, what's happening in the biosphere in, in New Zealand, and then ab above that, what are some of the social issues and what are the existing philanthropists, organisations, not-for-profits, um, incubators, universities, all aspects of the kind of ecosystem to think about what are the gaps and opportunities um, for them to collaborate together on um, 
the biggest issues to have maximum impact. And so um, I've been narrowing that down um, and we're really just starting to have some of those conversations now um, of, of what that looks like. But I think, um, broadly speaking, there's some really exciting um, opportunities in New Zealand around um, closed loop cycles with, with energy, water and waste, um, but also um, future models of collaboration between um, the not-for-profit sector um, and the business sector um, with philanthropists wanting to work with for, for maximum impact. Switching gears a little bit, um, you know, Simon, one of the things that we've talked about is uh, the various government programs which have been created to incentivize and encourage entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, NZVIF and the like. Um, could you maybe just touch on those and, and speak to, you know, the advantages that, that they might have for um, entrepreneurs uh, in New Zealand, but also entrepreneurs uh, who might be overseas, who would be looking at New Zealand as a place where they could come and work on these types of, of you know, uh, solutions? So, if you looked at all the different working components within it, if NZVIF is obviously there and it has its, its venture fund and its SCIF fund, or it's the seed capital investment fund to invest alongside other angel investors in, in New Zealand startup investments and they will they will match funding and that's quite important because uh, it typically means that in a lot of instances you only need to find half the funding of what you had originally planned from from angel investors and in fairness you know the angel community in New Zealand is just starting to to develop a little bit more there's more people starting to get involved involved in it and that's good. So, and in, in, in the actual opportunity that comes with SCIF, and as angels find out about that, it's a, it gives a little bit more comfort for new angels coming in to to know that some of the you know it's also being matched with some funding f from the government. They're also d doing a particularly good job in terms of um, looking at how New Zealand broadens out its its horizons. So they've had a recent deal with the Taiwanese government where there's agreed to be $200 million invested in Taiwanese and, and New Zealand companies with a view to fostering stronger relations between Taiwan and New Zealand and to use <coughs> the expertise that exist within Taiwan from the point of view of launching businesses into, into China. It's probably seen as a little bit more safe for New Zealand, so there was a delegation of Taiwanese venture capitalists out late last year, and we spoke to them about the opportunities in New Zealand, but the opportunities to take New Zealand businesses out, out to the world. So they do, they do a particularly good job in terms of in terms of co-matching, and then also for uh, through um, the VIF fund for uh, anyone who has funds that can qualify, they will dollar for dollar match into into investments with your right to to buy them out. So it's it's a bit of a kickstart for for the New Zealand in early stage investment community, which is which is quite important. Um, whether there's then issues of follow-on capital, um, uh, that, that's one of the, the things which sort of the next part that comes with that. Then you've got immigration who are doing their bits, which have been touched on a little bit already. Um, but you know, they're doing their best at bringing what I hope is smart capital into the country um, and, uh, and also skills, so identifying skill shortage areas, um, working with them. Uh, I mean, I, uh, appreciating the comments about New Zealand having a great um, e ecosystem for developing um, uh, software engineers um, and engineers down in universities like, like Canterbury as well. Um, <coughs> we're also a country which tends to reduce an awful lot of accountants and lawyers. Um, and hey, I'll you know, hold my hand up as being primarily responsible for shipping a lot of them overseas. But <laughs> um, it, some of that, uh, if, if I look at that, we talk about the, the fact that New Zealand's full of immigrants. Some of that has been from the fact that a lot of immigrants have come to, to New Zealand and they've wanted to ensure that their children go to university and get good jobs and being accountants and lawyers was their vision of what a good job was. 
So, so in this country, somehow we also have to educate people that um, educate the parents of children now, that that so that they can educate their children that what is important is uh, is not necessarily going and becoming a lawyer or an accountant, but it's about um, being a good person, making the right choices. Uh, um, and understanding that f that failure is all right, um, and and so we're actually we breed the next generation of people to come through in this country who can be those leaders, as well um, in in the world. Um, sorry, I got a bit off topic. So if we go back to if we go back to the uh, um, the so immigration, New Zealand are doing are doing a good job. Some of the capital will come in just as capital. Some of the things I'd like to see is maybe not the fact that you can invest in New Zealand bonds. Um, and that's, and you know, that's sort of considered okay as as your way to buy into the country. But how does it actually go into some more productive assets in in, in New Zealand? And then you've got um, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. And I think in the past, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise did a good job in, in respect of helping young businesses start up. They've still they've got something called a Beachheads program, which uh, allows a launching pad. For uh, for small businesses o overseas, um, and they used to have market development grants. They've sort of carved those back quite a lot now, and th their focus has tended to become a little bit more on how they work with large corporates mm. rather than small businesses. And that perhaps has been the one thing that's been a little bit disappointing for for me. Um, they didn't feel that they were getting value for money, and then there was a lot of people who came out and sort of said, "Well, I got a whole lot of government funding, and then I sold my business for." $10 million, um, best thing I ever did because basically they funded it for free and there became a lot of sort of bad press uh, around that and that was unfortunate because it kind of cut off those funds for the next wave of businesses that, that wanted to come through. So um, uh, I'd, I'd like to see that reintroduced mm. again in New Zealand. But I mean there's a reasonably good ecosystem um, around it, it's being able to navigate your way through it. It's it's not it's not easy to to find it and, and know about it, mm. um, and and that's what I'd like to see a little bit more visibility given to, so that people actually understand how they can work with government and how government can can assist them a little bit more because it's spread in lots of different places, and then you've got. Um, the Wellington, you know, Creative HQ. You've got lots of little sort of dollops of stuff, which is either local government or government funded, um, which you know you kind of need a roadmap mm. to, to to get around it. Mm. Um, and and I think pulling something together like that would be very very helpful because there are a lot of people who are willing to help. Mm. Cool. All right. So one more question for me, and then we'll open it up from the audience side. One of the themes, um, you know, the, that we've noticed is, is, you know, big being a big fan of sort of open source development and, um, you know, meeting a lot of sort of uh, lifestyle farmers and, and people uh, in New Zealand. Um, notice that there's this incredible amount of um, ingenuity uh, in the culture, you know, in people who are who are solving problems generally for themselves. And I think this speaks to, to Dave's point of. Um, it's not people solving problems to necessarily create good businesses out of it, but rather just solving a problem because they're facing it themselves, and so they're using the, the number eight wire approach. Um, you know, but it, it strikes me that it's a shame for all that really smart, hard work to not go into something that, that carries forth. And I'm really curious to hear, I mean, um, if you have any thoughts on, on how to capture that creative potential, the sort of cognitive surplus, which is going into all these garden and, and garage projects, um, and in using that to, to actually move those forward in, into creating something special um, that maybe could affect uh, change on a, on a larger scale, um, especially with relation to sort of the primary industries categories where, where New Zealand has such a unique uh, expertise and, and market position. Well, I think um, one of the key aspects just from what I've seen around the world and, and reflecting back on the opportunities for New Zealand and the context that you describe is 
um, when you marry up our, our skills of, of and abilities to be creative, to utilise good design thinking, to um, have evidence-based solutions, um, to work really rapidly together, when you marry that up with our skills in storytelling and, and filmmaking, um, I think there's, uh, for me, it is a kind of evolving um, opportunity that I see of, of telling, being the storytellers um, for the world and telling the stories of the work that people are already doing um, within New Zealand. And, and I, I know that many Kiwis know that we could do that better. Um, so it's not just, I guess, creating the new models um, for system change in which we can apply our thinking. It's also um, the smaller stories of, of innovation, um, particularly those where you have um, many mutually beneficial outcomes to show just how when you put your creative mind and the, the spirit, um, creativity behind entrepreneurship into solving some of these world's biggest challenges, whether you're working at an individual level, family, community, city, country or world, um, just what's possible. Uh, open it up if there's any questions from the audience here. Kia ora tato. I'm Kate Frickberg and lovely to, to be here today. <clears throat> um, one of the things we've talked about today is what makes New Zealand unique and also putting people and planet before profit. And one of the things we haven't talked about is uh, the role of Māori, particularly Māori business. Um, often I think Māori business is a very good example of incredibly successful entrepreneurship and also putting people before profit. As an example, Naitahu's taken their treaty settlement from 1.8 million to, I think, 1.2, 1.3 billion over the last 10 years. I mean, that's pretty impressive. So I'm interested in your take on what is the role of Māori business in this new New Zealand. Uh, yeah, um, I'm pleased that you asked that question um, because I didn't mention it and I think that it is um, a particular strength um, of this country. Um, and we think about what's required um, and how we could learn from the indigenous groups, not just within New Zealand, but around the world and the good work that's been done in those areas. Um, I've been having some discussions with Naitahu and, and others about the potential for New Zealand um, to facilita facilitate the development of a cultural profit and loss account. So how could you, for example, um, harness uh, all of that knowledge and wisdom about living with nature and about um, business for people, planet and profit. How could you put that into a balance sheet? Jochen Zeitz, um, you, you may have heard, you know, transform the face of Puma by developing an environmental profit and loss and we're scaling that globally. So that's putting a, a price on your environmental impact. We're starting to work on social profit and loss, but no one is really thinking about how you might um, develop a cultural profit and loss, and I think that that's something that New Zealand could develop here and be um, world leaders in. Um, we've already done some work on biodiversity accounting, and I think we can utilise some of the methodologies um, in that space. Simon, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, just like what are the top couple objections that you see from the investment community in terms of, you know, obstacles and bringing more resources to the country and uh, any other further thoughts of things that we can all do to uh, remove those obstacles? So objections from foreigners coming to New Zealand? Yeah. Potentially the number of days. That they have to they have to be in New Zealand for. Um, I think that you know when when you work with immigration, you can ask them to to get some form of of dispensation for that. It's a little bit. I, I think being a New Zealander is a state of mind, not a state of body. <coughs> and there are, there are plenty of people who they live overseas, but they still consider themselves to be New Zealanders. So so why should you have to be here for a certain length of time, in in order to be a New Zealander? So if we make this a bit more about a, a, a culture and a way of life, then you've agreed to sign up to that culture and, and, and way of life rather than having to spend time here. 
And as we've already said, you know, the world is going global and uh, the barriers to living in different places are, are, are diminishing every single day. New Zealand really should be doing what it, what it can to, to capture the hearts and minds of people. And if that means they want to come and live here, great. If it means that they, they want to be ambassadors for New Zealand, they can do that just as easily from, from overseas. Um, so I'd like to see them loosen up a little bit on that. Um, maybe uh, they are doing good work immigration immigration New Zealand in terms of getting out and doing road shows amongst um, high net worth individuals in the states in Japan through Asia um, so I think that they're slowly they're slowly starting to promote that how they could actually work with other New Zealanders and have other New Zealanders involved in that process and it not just being a government initiative but actually getting key key Kiwis or even just, um, as we've already said, you know, your average Kiwi on the street, because generally they, they, they embody the same attitudes that, that people will have, um, and, and just to sort of let people know that there's more of that equality in New Zealand, that uh, you know, you're just as likely to have a conversation, I think, as we discussed with the, with the person in the dairy as you are with the CEO in the boardroom. It's, there's, there's not that sort of, level of social hierarchy in, in the country and using that as a, as a selling point to the country because a lot of people just want to get out of that um, and they don't see that as being, as being important and I think that's something that New Zealand's always been very good at doing and, and with that lack of social hierarchy I think you get a better facilitation of, of ideas. Um, you know, that, that said, you know, your garage entrepreneurs in New Zealand can sometimes be a little bit sort of scared to share their ideas until they think they're absolutely perfect. So I think um, getting that fear of failure that, w that we've talked about and, and getting away from the a, a, a bit to the mentality of the tall poppy syndrome or, you know, maybe I'll be laughed at and, and having that accepted, then that would be, that would be good for me. Um, so anything you guys can come up with to break down those barriers in conjunction with anyone else I'd, I'd be most um, willing to work on. But yeah, I mean just yeah, making New Zealand seem very real and, and, and selling New Zealand to people on the basis of what it is. Um, and if, the, if that means having a cross section of people that they can meet because that's what their life's going to be like, then, then great. Um, letting them know what investment opportunities exist in New Zealand and how exciting it, it can actually be. Um, and uh, Dave will attest to this, it can be a bit of a roller coaster ride when you get involved with startups, with startups in New Zealand. Um, and, and also letting them understand that we really value their skills as well. Um, so you know, it not being necessarily about a, an exercise in how much money you've got in the bank but a bit an exercise in the New Zealand government understanding what some of the really key skills that people can bring into the country are. And those skills might range from the networks that those people have to, to the understanding that they have about particular subjects and topics. Um, because we're a country of generalists, we do suffer from, uh, from not being specialists at, at, at times. You, know, you, you do need... You need to bring specialisms into business to, to to grow them. And because we'll try and think that we can solve every single problem ourselves, we can be quite pig headed at times in New Zealand and we try and we try and solve problems that people have already solved. Um, because we're not we don't we're not prepared to look outside of New Zealand. Um, and so you, we see plenty of examples of where people have reinvented the wheel and then they come going, look, here's, here's a great business idea and a great startup idea. And you go, yeah, well, look, it, it was. And here's the business that did it 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, there, there are, there are, there are follow-on things. So I'd like to see those skills brought into the country and sort of an uh, ob objective um, set, of, set of skills, not just... Look, I did an engineering degree here, but w what are actually some of the more robust and, and interesting skills that you that you bring to the country? One of the things that <coughs> fascinates me is uh, here in New Zealand how we're one of the, we're the first to admit all the things we're not really good at. 
very different from every country that I've been to. Um, my question to you guys is around balancing between uh, all the progress that we want to achieve, the, uh, the ways we want to serve as a model, the experimentation, the investments that we want to bring into the country uh, with preserving what's beautiful, what's true, because that's what at least brought me to this country, and I, I believe that's what keeps everybody here. So how do we balance all the vision and ideas that we have for what New Zealand can be uh, and preserve what's, what's great about it and what everybody likes about it right now? I, I guess um, for me, I, I don't see that as something that needs to be balanced. I think that the, the two are um, necessary to enable each other. Um, that we've, we've just started on the pathway of what kind of opportunity we could unleash to create a prosperous, beautiful country through utilising the skill sets that we've just spoken about. So one of the things I think that we could do to maybe help with that decision making process because the word balance gets used a lot within government here you know we need to balance economic development with environmental protection um, how about we shift the conversation around of how can we regenerate this country and, and, and turn it into the most prosperous greenest jewel on the edge of the earth um, what does that look like actually what does this look like where are we now? How are we going to move from this to this, to this vision that we can co-create together? What are those pivot points? Um, because when you speak to people, I think we could really quickly get to that page of what that regenerative, beautiful future looks like. We can see it. Um, we just need to articulate it and create that pathway. So there is no need for balance or trade-off um, we're not a wealthy country, relatively. We're going, you know, we all know that we're slipping down um, many ranks, and so we need to think about them as um, being mutually beneficial. <coughs> My only sort of comment on it, and I'll try not to be negative about it, so New Zealand, I think, just needs to promote more success stories in, in areas where we are being successful. So, I mean, I think we talked about, about Rod Drury, but there are many other examples of, of people who have done equally as well and celebrate celebrate our successes really well and have people understand that New Zealand is doing well and we can build things on the, on the world stage from here and not have them get so worried about the value of their property um, and looking at how they can invest their time and effort into, into other things and money into other things in New Zealand and be a contributing member um, of society. I mean, interestingly enough, we fund some research um, for, a, for a PhD student who looked at the experiences of expats returning to, to New Zealand and, and how they found it, and they found a very dissociative experience coming from, from overseas to being back in New Zealand because people would be talking about the fact that their neighbours' trees were growing over onto their property and how they were going to get their chainsaw out and hack it down or go and drill a hole in it and poison the tree because they were sick of it. And they wanted to talk about the fun experiences that they had had travelling through India or Morocco or doing different different things. And you actually ended up with people, uh, people in New Zealand who came back who actually got quite depressed about coming back to New Zealand and then decided that it wasn't good for them and left. So, so part of it is about, uh, is about helping people reintegrate back into New Zealand, helping people integrate into, into the country properly and, and getting them feeling like they're a contributing member of, of the society quite quickly. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for your, your time and insight. Really appreciate it. And uh, I hope.